we're going to talk about what's holding the UK back, although we kind of changed that question when we were talking about it beforehand and talk more around what's the UK outlook going to look like for UK fintech, which at this point of time is seeing um, a boom taking place. Uh, Q1 beat all records. Uh, last year, 39% of all European fintech funding came into the UK economy um, from the European um, funds. I think 21% went into Berlin, and then it goes down from there. Um, and we've seen uh, UK fintech challenging Silicon Valley with uh, the number of unicorns that are homegrown here. So before we go to introduce our esteemed panelists, I just wanted to ask you a question. I think you've got the app. And uh, if you've been using it this morning, you'll therefore know that you can vote. And I would like you to vote on this question, which is coming up, hopefully in a second. How's the UK fintech market going to look over the next five to ten years? Do you think it will continue to boom, or do you think it's going to struggle? Or you may just say, actually, um, it's going to be somewhere in between, which will divide the vote. But we didn't want to say it could be somewhere in between. You've got to take a view. Is it going to continue to go up, or is it going to go down uh, in terms of the outlook that you see? about where the UK fintech economy is going in the future in the next five to 10 years. Now, please continue to vote on that as we introduce our panelists. And I want them to also talk about their views on, are we going to continue to boom or struggle? And you may know all, all of these guys, but I think uh, I wanted them to actually introduce themselves first in case you didn't know them. Uh, so Eileen, Eileen Burbridge of Passion Capital, maybe you could start us off. And how do you see the outlook? Sure. And can you leave the um, vote up there so we can see what everyone in the audience is saying. I think that the audience is saying it's going to continue to boom. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me, and thanks to Innovate Finance for putting on another great summit, as they do every year. Um, just to briefly sort of say thank you for introducing me, I am a partner at Passion Capital. It's an early stage venture fund. It's not a fintech specific fund, but we have seen about a third of our portfolio over the last nine years going into fintech, if you think of it very broadly as to include insure tech, property tech. Um, you know, fraud detection and cybersecurity, for example. Um, in addition, I'm also uh, the Treasury Envoy for FinTech um, and also chair the Finance Delivery Panel, um, which is in combination or conjunction between Tech Nation um, and uh, HM Treasury. Um, so to answer your question, uh, since you're going to put us on the spot, if it's binary and we can only choose one or the other, um, I would choose booming over struggling. Um, and obviously, the, the real answer is it's always on a relative basis, right? I think that the UK fintech sector is absolutely flying, and for really good reason, which I'm sure we're all going to talk about in the actual conversation. I think the only sort of um, you know, shadow on the sort of forecast is really the uncertainty that we're in right now. So in a way, I feel like we're in the greatest period of uncertainty right now with respect to Brexit and potentially the passporting ability of financial services companies, those that need that regulator, regulator license. Um, and what will happen to them over the next sort of, um, maybe it's going to be about two to four years uh, since it'll be post some transition and then before you kind of get everything established, right? But then between those two, struggling and booming, I'm absolutely uh, convinced that we'll continue to have a really strong fintech sector and financial services sector here in the UK just because of what an epicenter of talent, capital markets, and also just sort of uh, momentum we already have, frankly. Um, I should probably add on to that, you know, the regulator will hopefully continue to be as progressive and innovative as it's been over the last sort of five to ten years, ever since the last financial crisis, and that'll go a long way in, in ensuring that we have a booming sector as well. Thanks very much, Eileen. Sure. Charles Andrews, who's uh, actually chairing a number of companies, but uh, you chair the one that I cite as my first ever example of a fintech company, which is Zopa, who I first met on the 30th of March 2005, and I remember it well. Wow. Giles. So, so do I. Um, thanks very much, Chris. <laughs> thanks for asking me to speak today. Um, so yes, I, I was one of the founders of Zopa, uh, and we did go and pitch at one of Chris's events in March um, 2005, the month we launched. Um, I'm not sure we are the first. I, I think PayPal probably have a greater claim to, claim to fame than Zopa, but in, in, in the UK, I think we can, we can say we were amongst the first. Um, I also I, I chair a number of other businesses, mainly in the lending space. So I, I chair a consumer lending business called Credit Tech in Germany, uh, an invoice discounting platform in the UK called Market Invoice. Um, a mortgage lending business in Amsterdam uh, called Dynamic Credit and also a social investment fund in London. Um, so there's a theme there, two out of the five things I do are outside of the UK, so there's, there's some optimism about pursuing uh, passes outside of the UK as well as limiting myself to this country. But notwithstanding that, I absolutely think that fintech is, going to, is booming for good reason, for all the reasons uh, Eileen gave as to why the UK is a natural epicenter for fintech activities. I'd add one more, and that's consumers. I think the UK is full of 
some of the most digitally savvy consumers in the world. We have amongst the highest, if not the highest, depending on which measure, e-commerce penetration um, and penetration of financial uh, applications as well. So I think we're in good shape with some headwinds uh, notwithstanding. Thanks, Charles. Next is uh, Elliot Cole, who is the CEO of Octopus Ventures, one of the leading fintech VC funds um, investing across Europe and particularly in the UK. Uh, Elliot. Well, thank you for having me. So, uh, Octopus Ventures, we exist to help pioneers change the world. We invest in the future of money, the future of industry, and the future of health. We invest about 200 million sterling a year that makes us one of the most active seed, seed and Series A investors across Europe. We have offices in London, New York, and people on the ground in, in the Valley, Singapore, and China to help our businesses scale across uh, countries and into new territories. Um, in terms of the outlook for fintech in, in the UK and more broadly into Europe, we're very bullish on this market. We think the opportunity is measured in billions, and we believe that the um, momentum built over the last 11 years by many, many founders building successful businesses like Zopa is just getting going. Um, to add to the long list of things to be optimistic about, I um, would consider the investment um, environment in the UK um, as a centre of uh, or focus for fintech is only growing, uh, particularly in the last two to three years, we've welcomed many strategic investors, the likes of City Ventures, uh, increasingly active and, and a welcome partner to several of our businesses. Thank you very much, Elliot. And as you referenced, Louis, who's sitting next to you, uh, Louis Valdic heads up uh, City Ventures, which is a corporate venture capital fund. Um, and you're based in New York, but uh, you said you come over here pretty often. I can guess why. That, that's right. And thanks very much, Elliot, for, for that good word. And indeed, uh, great to be here. Thanks. Innovate Finance uh, for the opportunity to speak um, today. And uh, uh, City Ventures, as you probably uh, would infer from the name, is part of City, the global bank, and specifically a innovation arm. Uh, one of the groups is venture investing, and I'm a part of that, but also there's other groups that work into internal innovation within City and in partnerships with other corporates, with universities, and, and the like. Um, in terms of and we invest obviously in fintech, but also in enterprise technology in, in things that would be relevant to a large bank. And we help leverage our franchise not only uh, to drive connectivity with the bank, but also with our corporate uh, and investment uh, clients, as well as with our consumer franchise. Um, in terms of the question, um, I also would put myself on the booming um, camp, you know, noting you know, the feedback that has been uh, given about some of the you know, current challenges and some of the structural benefits, and I'll add you know, just one more to the mix, which is that in order to sustain strong uh, pockets of um, innovation, you need to have ecosystems that include successful entrepreneurs that have had meaningful exits. Mm -hmm. And we've been experiencing literally in the past 12 or so months some pretty exciting examples of that, you know, looking back you know, a few years ago, you know, and by the way, I was in London in a previous life when uh, I was running strategic investments for another corporate, and I was based here for a few years, so generally I, I always had, you know, very strong positive uh, views on, um, on, on London in the ecosystem, but as we were discussing with Inside Ventures, should we have a physical presence there, one of the pushbacks was, where are the exits? Where are the big exits? And I think certainly, <laughs> We've seen you know, very good stories recently, and I think that adds an interesting mix of people that have gotten liquidity, can start powering angel ecosystems. You have lots of people having gotten liquidity, you know, early employees and, and the like. So I think that will be also a, an important catalyst for the important uh, you know, uh, boom that I expect. And uh, we are, by the way, in the process of hiring somebody to be based uh, in London, literally sending an offer out, uh, hopefully today, so. <laughs> so let's just build on this theme, but before we do that, can we just see what the final view of the audience was to that question? If you can give the final numbers from the audience. So we're, ah, one in four not, not convinced. Um, so not, not everyone believes in a bright future for UK fintech. Who are the heretics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things, that obviously, let's get it off the table as quickly as we can is Brexit. So we don't want to linger on this, but what is going to be the impact? We have no idea. All I know is that on the 31st of October this year, I'm dressing up as Jacob Rees-Mogg. 
Um, but if you looked at the impact of Brexit, I, for me, for UK fintech, the only thing I think that would really impact and cause struggling would be the loss of freedom of movement of people because so many of the UK fintech startups have a talent pool of Europeans. Um, would you agree with that or do you think there's other things that would which we should bear in mind? I think, I think with caveats that, you know, I think the ecosystem will generally continue to thrive. I do think there are other risks. Um, so in addition to freedom of movement for new talent coming into the UK, I think the other reason we have such a thriving ecosystem is because of the existing financial services, institutions and banks that are headquartered in London, in the city of London, because of what is a center it is for financial services. To the extent that any of those decide to relocate, move headquarters or move offices, from London to Amsterdam or Frankfurt, I think you lose a potential talent pool there as well because we see a lot of people coming from financial services that are the ones that are the entrepreneurs in fintech ventures. So I think that's a risk. And then I do think it's a small risk though and probably overstated too much, but um, I think research shows that maybe 40%, 25 to 40% of companies that describe themselves as fintechs actually need a license. Um, but for those that do, so maybe it's one in four, maybe it's a little bit more than that, I do think there's also the uncertainty about whether or not they'll be able to passport, although you know, the Chancellor has previously indicated that you know, they would seek to get at least some kind of equivalence uh, so that hopefully there's not too much uncertainty. But that's the other, I think, um, issue as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump to the end of the panel and then come to Giles the last, because Giles, I think you have a different view of the world because you're not an investor, you're more of an uh, entrepreneurial growth um, startup guy. Um, so Louis, what, how, how do you see the outlook? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I would agree with um, what Aline said, not, nothing significant to, uh, to add. Elio? Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd probably um, counter that and just say that um, in the short to the medium term, I don't think many of the founders that we back give this a second thought, honestly. Um, I think geopolitical risk in terms of the um, immediacy and pain of risk mm. that they face every hour of every day trying to survive is a bit of a luxury. Um, and in the short to medium term, I don't expect there to be a direct impact on access to talent. Um, I think that can change, however. Um, one caveat to this is that a, a large percentage of the teams that work in our portfolio are from continental Europe and further afield. And on an emotional basis, the decision to leave um, struck a um, struck a rather painful chord. And uh, I think that residual emotion is still uh, still quite strong. Yep. And the reason I kept you to last, Giles, is I say you see it from the other side in terms of building a business. So how is your sort of five companies, particularly as two of them are in Europe, you know, viewing the world? So I think, I think there's a question for companies that will require passporting of their services abroad that will unquestionably be more difficult. But I think, as has been said, that actually applies to a relatively small number. Certainly, um, Zopa's not looking to passport its services abroad. And the ones that are in continental Europe at the moment will probably stay on the continent rather than necessarily coming over here. I think in the long run, um, what worries me more is, uh, is not just the, the lack of uh, access to talent uh, sort of throughout the company level, but at founder level. I mean, I think um, countries should be positioning themselves as the best possible place for people to start businesses. And that's the secret to long-term economic growth. Um, and I worry that someone who's sitting there in their loft somewhere uh, <laughs> outside of the UK sits, where should I go? The UK was a no-brainer five mm -hmm. years ago, probably still is uh, to some extent today. Will it be in five years? I don't know. I mean, I, I, but I would, I would worry about losing access to that sort of talent. Perhaps the, um, the same thing's happening in the US as well, though. Um, so, well, I've, so, I've often said that's kind of our so biggest risk saved. mitigator. <laughs> yeah, the last exactly, years, perhaps we're, yeah. we're being saved by, by events in the US in the short term. <laughs> it's all relative, that's yeah, what exactly, we said. Yeah. Exactly, but entrepreneurs thrive on change, so change in, in and of itself is, is not a bad thing. And as I said at the start, we got 39% of the European fintech investments coming through UK fintech. Uh, so right now, it's a lion's share, double that of Germany and mm. most of the rest of the other countries. Um, I think what's interesting in moving away from Brexit, um, but looking at the investment um, ecosystem around the UK, it's incredibly strong. Um, and maybe again, Giles, you could kick this one off because you know, you've been looking at getting investments in startup businesses. Uh, how has that changed over the years, and how do you see the UK fintech ecosystem for investment? So, so I think, I mean, I, I hear sometimes that, that 
there's a shortage of funds in the UK, which I absolutely don't buy. I, I think good ideas get funded in the UK. I have done in, in March, so I've been raising venture capital money for 14 years. And in that period, um, I, I've yet to come across a team that I really thought should have been funded mm. that wasn't. Mm. So, so I, I don't think there's a, a lack of money. I hear lots of people who don't get funding who complain bitterly about the lack of funding in London. But I think they're, they're remarkably unself-aware in <laughs> saying it. Um, I think the landscape's changed, though, in the sense that funds have become more specialised. Entrepreneurs have arguably the luxury of a bit more choice these days. Um, so when we started out, we were uh, seeking investment from the, um, the, the pool of people who invested in consumer internet and technology. Uh, FinTech as a category didn't exist. Um, so I, I welcome the degree of specialization and I welcome the rise of, of, of the corporates mm. because in the right, at the right time and place, so uh, a company I'm involved with, Market Invoice, has just raised substantial funds from both Barclays Bank and Santander. Interestingly, for slightly different reasons. So the Barclays deal was really um, as, a, as a prelude to a, a big business development deal to roll out the market invoice product across the whole country uh, to, through all their relationship managers. Um, so that was a, a very strategic corporate investment, um, whereas the Santander investment was perhaps more halfway between that and a uh, venture capital investment. So Santander perhaps have a, a better established venture fund where their reason for making the investment is as much to learn about new things that are happening in their world as it is to necessarily strategically partner with them. Um, but both, I welcome both of those developments because um, for fintech businesses, uh, to be able to partner with major incumbent businesses is mm. a huge advantage in distribution. It's been really, really difficult for many, many years and lots of partnerships that should have happened probably never did. Um, so if, uh, if, if some kind of co-investment helps oil those wheels and, and make those partnerships happen and, and make our fintech products available to the millions of incumbent mm -hmm. uh, bank customers, that's a really good thing. And I also see increasingly that some of the incumbents recognize they're perhaps a little bit more introspective and they recognize what they can and can't do a bit better than they did five years ago. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And as we've got a corporate venture capital guy here, so what's driving City Ventures in, in terms of how do you select where you're investing and what you're investing in? And is there any um, you know, th view around cannibalization or is it all about innovation? Yeah, it's really driven out of innovation. And um, you know, to echo the point that was being made by Giles uh, in terms of the different models, right? Barclays, uh, Santander, City Ventures probably more in the Santander, you know, looking both at you know, a company, a startup, as a pure VC, are we really excited about it? But also, is there here an opportunity to create value, to drive innovation, you know, to the bank, to the broader franchise? And um, if, you know, strategically, conceptually, it makes sense, we will do it irrespective of whether there's something already in place to partner, as you know, doing partnerships with big banks takes yeah. a very long time. So many times we're ahead of, uh, of the partnership, if you will. But uh, so interesting, really it's sometimes easier to get money out of a big bank than it is a partnership. Than, 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 it than is. The partnership. So it the is. money is a route to it, means for uh, it, in a way. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But, um, but clearly, uh, it's also important though, when you're looking into partnering with, uh, with, with big banks, to make sure that there's clear understanding on both sides, because sometimes, you know, a pitfall can happen when, when banks can overwhelm, uh, you know, with internal requirements and, and ask startups to change how they do things and become more of a services organization catering to the unique need that the bank has versus being a great product company. So at City Ventures, we try to, if you will, you know, keep that balance right and push back a bit into the, into the business if it's pushing too hard in terms of encumbering the startup you know, so that we ultimately you know, protect the core so that it can thrive as a, as a great uh, company uh, independently. And, uh, to the other point, I think Alec had mentioned a little bit, you know, within the UK uh, ecosystem, the fact that there's so many very large and successful corporates, you know, UK and international companies that happen to have very significant operations here, bodes very well for startups uh, out of the UK in terms of, uh, you know, opportunities to partner. And I think it's quite interesting in that, um, you know, I've been around this area for quite a while, showing my grey hair and wrinkles, and you don't have any wrinkles or grey hair, but you're doing pretty well in terms of being around this ecosystem for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> and Ali, I know you've been you know, around the UK fintech scene for some time, so how have you seen the investment landscape changing in the time mm. that you've been involved here? 
No, I just think uh, it's kind of been mentioned, I think, but when we first started investing in fintech, maybe to Giles' point, we weren't calling it fintech. I actually remember it was probably about uh, 2013, 2012, 2013 that someone used that term, and I'm sure I rolled my eyes at it the first time. <laughs> um, so I think it's obviously uh, developed a long way. I think the biggest difference that we've seen, not only have we as a UK-based fund started looking at the sector with great attention, but we get a lot of inbound calls from people who want to co-invest with us either from the United States or from Asia, thinking about the UK as a place to invest in fintech because it's so much, uh, you know, it's almost a petri dish and the environment here so much more conducive to a successful fintech company than in either of their home markets or their respective markets based on sort of the oh. regulatory cover and the entrepreneurs and the talent. Um, so I think that's the biggest change that I've seen in addition to things like specialist funds or corporate venture funds, um, which is really good to see. I think. If I tie that back to your last question or the discussion topic, maybe the risk over the next couple of years is if we have any kind of an, uh, a correction or a dampening um, in, in the economy, you know, the question is probably whether or not the corporate venture funds you know, will continue to invest to the degree that they have been in the last couple of years or if they'll need to kind of sit back for a little bit and protect the balance sheet. Uh, similarly, we probably had a very real world uh, situation or risk with the European Investment Bank, which was a very large um, limited partner investor in venture funds in the UK, but that has been uh, sort of covered by the British Business Bank, which is good, but I think what I'm pointing out is there are risks that we need to mitigate, which unfortunately, you know, are kind of um, their own, own goals. We're self-inflicting <laughs> these kind of wounds uh, upon our own sector, which is a shame, but such is the case. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to go down that route. <laughs> Alia, do you want so, to add so I anything? I think um, over the last 11, 10 or 11 years, you've seen um, the Valley's leadership uh, evolve to extents where you, know, you now think about Boston, New York, um, Boulder, Austin, um, Stockholm, Berlin, London, Paris. And so it's more about the cities than, than the countries, I'd say. The second thing that's happened is that venture capital has become a, a global um, investment industry. I think if you look back to 2006, 7, when Octopus first started investing, it was as much a cottage industry as anything else, and the idea of getting a Valley investor investing in the UK was somewhat laughable. Um, and uh, the strides made by you know, the series of governments over the last um, 11 years has really hit home. I mean, we kind of... I think I rolled my eyes at the idea of Silicon Roundabout but, um, and Tech Nation even, but yet these initiatives have proven quite effective. Mm. And when you have the Lord Mayor, I think, over the weekend, um, making the observation that we need to be forgiving when fintechs make mistakes because they're growing so quickly and they will make mistakes and we need to be able to... Um, acknowledge that and, and, and support them as they grow. That points to a you know, fantastic ecosystem we built here. I think. Mm. And I think your point about its cities rather than countries is really important. I remember seeing Kiel Nordstrom, one of the co-authors of Freakonomics, speaking about cities being countries in effect these days because they have such an ecosystem and infrastructure of talent. And I just saw, for example, that JP Morgan's putting all of their cloud-based services centers into Silicon Valley because that's where the engineering talent is. They can't get it in New York. Um, and I think that's one of the key factors that is reason for London investment booming and continuing. But what, sorry, do you, do you want to it's add? Fine. I, I think the, the other, you know, it may go counter to that, but the, the other observation was that you know, when you were building a business of any scale up until about 2009-10, as soon as you got to a point of wishing to go international, you had to invest in really significant um, infrastructure and you therefore had to go to where the areas of expertise were to build that infrastructure and that was in the valley and the greatest gift from the valley over the last 10 years to my mind is is the cloud <laughs> and so you can fundamentally build a business for massive scale from anywhere in the world and that used to be a sort of rallying cry from London and Stockholm and Berlin but it was untrue until you had access to things like AWS and S3 and PayPal and Salesforce and all these things we take for granted and I think in conjunction with that you've had the sort of um, advent of uh, knowledge sharing so, you know, Fred Wilson blogging day in, day out for the last 18 years, and Steve Blank 
and the lean startup. And Chris Skinner. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are all you know, seismic changes, and, and, and it means that the, the know-how and knowledge about how to take a business from you know, 0 to 10, from 10 to 30 to 30 to 100, is now available to founders across the globe. And, and you know, we're starting to uh, industrialize that with programs like EF out of the UK and more broadly. So uh, you know, again, food for thought. I'm aware of time um, for this panel because it runs by so quickly, but I wanted to come back to Asian genes, um, which is actually because China's become quite a big mm. fintech community growth cycle recently, particularly uh, both big tech and fintech with um, Alibaba and um, Tencent, um, at Pingan, et cetera. Um, and you know, the, 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 on the global backdrop, how do you think the UK sits today between the US and China? So I personally, I, I think that the UK is a bigger concern and has greater impact on the global market than the US. I think it does actually in terms of reach uh, relative to China as well. It's just that China's domestic market is so big they don't need to be sort of globally minded in order to have these successes. But that's why I think actually, if you think about it worldwide, the impact and the reach or the engagement that, I guess if we're talking about countries, can have within their sectors, I do think the UK's reach is greater. It goes further. It might not be as big because it's domestic market. Our domestic market isn't as big as mm. either China or the United States, but our reach is definitely further. That would be the way I would think about it. And, and do you see that changing? or? Uh, no, I don't think it's I think even if we, again, if I think about the worst case scenario and if I'm um, you know, a little bit more bearish and I think we have a correction here, I don't see the Chinese market being any more globally oriented or globally minded. I think they will continue to be very focused on their domestic issues um, and their nationalistic um, concerns and growth. So I think that stays quite static. I think that you might see forces coming from Southeast Asia, you might see Japan, for example, or you might see emergence from other areas of Asia, maybe India. But I don't think China will become even more globally minded over the next sort of three to four, five years or the period that we're talking about. And I thought That's it was in, in, interesting about. before we started the panel, Ali, that you were mentioning that you've got a lot of US uh, corporate venture capital funds coming into the U mm. UK market. And just in the last 12 months, um, again, internationally, how do you see that, that changing and transforming? So um, as it relates to fintech, I think from the point that we invest, which is seed and series A, our objective is to help businesses get to 10 to 15 to 20 million uh, pounds in revenue. And often the domestic market can um, afford that opportunity. Where we struggle is encouraging businesses to internationalize earlier than that, um, unless they're building for a global audience on day one. And within our portfolio on a fintech basis, we have one or two examples of that. But for the most part, they're building for a domestic audience to begin with. So we've got to move towards a close. And I wanted to repeat the question we asked at the start at the end, because I wanted to see what you thought at the end of this panel, whether you've shifted your positions at all. So can we bring up that question around, um, is it going to continue booming or struggling in the future? And please vote a second time. It's going to be very depressing if we put you off. I, was, I don't think we were trying to persuade anybody. But. No, no. But we were a very optimistic panel. And I guess just to close, and Louis, maybe we can start from your side this time. Um, as we look forward, um, I, I guess there's a bigger question around the fintech market itself has been booming. Uh, and a lot of people keep saying the fintech market is going to bust. So forget the UK. What's the outlook for the fintech market? Yeah, so... so Two, two thoughts on the one side, uh, valuations continue to be uh, a bit uh, frothy. So, you know, uh, on the one side, uh, companies, you know, tend to be growing extremely well and maybe can grow into those uh, valuations. I don't know whether you can sustain the frothiness for, for too long. Um, but at the same time, the financial services industry is humongous and you know all, all the numbers that, that we talk about in terms of what's being funded and you know they're, they're big numbers in, in absolute terms but in relative terms relative to the size uh, of the economy uh, you know globally associated with, with financial services to revenue and profit pools they're still not huge so there is certainly a lot of room uh, for the trend to continue but at some point, I, I assume that the valuations will have to be a bit more <laughs> <laughs> reflective of the underlying performance. And that happens a little bit maybe more, you know, later, you know, in very early rounds, you know, it's, 
it's maybe not as frothy, but certainly um, I see a lot of uh, expensive valuations out there. I mean, my view is for so long as financial institutions are so widely distrusted mm. and score so poorly on any CSAT score, there's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to come in and, and rebuild that social contract and build very, very sizable businesses. So a question for the audience, will the term fintech exist in 10 years' time? <laughs> or will the successful businesses we call fintechs today have become major businesses at real, operating at real scale? And will some of the incumbents have been forced to change and adapt and become much more technology-led and more customer-led uh, to try and deal with that trust deficit? So I see a convergence. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see some, some existing current fintech businesses reaching real scale. So again, I guess we're so optimistic. That's probably why we're on the panel. Um, I, I also think it's, it's going to continue booming. I actually think, um, you know, valuations aside, I actually think we're at the very beginning of sort of what's happening with fintech on its journey to becoming all of financial services in that I think a lot of the early, and even to the valuations point, a lot of the earlier innovation has been very consumer focused. Not all of it, but much of it. So payments, remittances, um, you know, uh, even um, financial transactions, even uh, if you think about sort of fraud detection, security, and things. A lot of it has been consumer-oriented. Re retail point, banking, more exactly. Obvious. The entrepreneurs are solving problems that they face themselves initially. Mm -hmm. And I think very similar to kind of, you know, what happened with the first kind of internet, I guess, wave or dot-com boom, is you had all these companies, whether they're eBay, Amazon, PayPal, or, you know, put it in that, or even Yahoo. And then it wasn't until 1999, which is really kind of the cliff edge of the dot-com bust, that Salesforce was incorporated as a company, so your kind of first true enterprise internet or technology or purely digital business. And I think we are just getting to the point where you're going to start seeing enterprise fintech or you know, fintech for financial services um, entities and for organizations that are delivering services to consumers. And I think as we saw in that first kind of internet wave, the value creation in that part of the sector is actually far greater than direct to consumer. Yep. So I think there's a lot more to come. And one of the things I keep talking about is it's more the digital transformation of planet Earth, of mm -hmm. which financial services happens to be a part. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, that is the end of our panel. Before we just walk off the stage, can we see what the final vote was on the second time round? If it changed at all? Exactly the same, 72-28. Oh, look at that. Hey! Oh, it's so booming. <laughs> we got rid of 15% of the naysayers. <laughs> Excellent. Good move, guys. Excellent. That just shows what an effective panel this was. Thank oh, you very oh, much, oh, Louise. Shows the power oh, of democracy. Exactly. <laughs> Eileen, thank you. Thank you very much.